my name is Tim Myers. I'm Eric Pricehunter. I'm Dan Stella. And our senior project is the Shuffleboard Scorekeeper. And what the Shuffleboard Scorekeeper does is it automates the task of scoring a game on tabletop shuffleboard. So after you throw pucks, it detects all the different tosses and then scores the board, uh, shoots the score up in the, on the GUI, and then at the end when the score is over, and the game, send all the statistics to a database if you want to keep track of that, and all sorts of other school, cool stuff. Uh, now the way we actually do everything is through two cameras and a bunch of image processing. And that was your code, so maybe you want to talk about that. So uh, basically there's, there's two tasks going on where we start playing the game, and one is the side of the people shooting, and the other is when it scores, and basically what goes on is this, this, the camera from the shooting side will detect motion by basically just differencing frames. Because mm -hmm. both the cameras just run and they just buffer images. And as the images buffer, his, uh, Eric's actually logic code will grab each frame and diff, diff them together. And if there's any sort of pixel difference, it will, it will like start like a we see movement type frame. And after that goes for a while, if it stops, it signals that a puck was tossed. We figured since a system like this is going to go on an actual shuffleboard table, that it needs to have an easier inter interface. So we decided on using a keypad because small amount of keys, so we don't have to deal with a lot of malicious input. Uh, and we could also go with a keypad design similar to a phone, and everyone has a cell phone now, so they know how to enter uh, characters on a keypad. It's very intuitive. So what we do here is if you see the GUI, we're at the main menu. We have four options. To play a game, which is where the meat of the stuff, the program is, Set up a tournament, which was extra functionality that we created, so you can set up a tournament from 4 to 16 teams. Uh, the high scores menu, which we can just go to right now, and that shows the, uh, all the high scores that are currently in the database, at the top 15 or 16. So if you look, we were playing the other night, Eric scored 25 points, had 18 knockoffs, zero hangers, and he won 10 rounds. So as more games are played, more scores will go into the database and this will update. Settings allows you to clear the high scores, change MP3 location. Right now it has a default location on the drive and it can also play music CDs. I believe we have a CD in there so we can change the music source to MP3 CD. It'll read the CD and then load that up. Now if you want to play music you just hit play on the keypad. You have a previous song and next song. So if we do that it'll come up and the speakers are under the table they're just hooked up to the laptop. We'll add the first player, and we'll say, I'm going to play. And if we want to keep statistics in the database, we say yes, and it allows you to enter a four-digit password so you can save your information. So I want to keep my statistics. Singles matches go to 15 points. Doubles matches go to 21. So if you don't enter a score, it'll assume you want the default sure. and go through. So start the game. And now we have to wait a little bit for the cameras to power up because they haven't been started. So once the cameras both power up, it'll say go. Okay. Um, it randomly picks which player to go first. And if you look, see at the GUI, uh, the player who is going first, so Eric, he's blue. If you remember from the last screen, he's yeah. highlighted in blue, so he has to throw the first puck. And if you had other players, you would see red player two here, and you would see blue player two here. Uh, left side shoot is highlighted because we're shooting from the left side. Good. Uh, so Eric, if you'd like to throw the first puck. All right. And you also have this. If uh, the, the cameras that are trolling for motion, if you're if any sort of motion there goes on past there. this line, there was there. Hand no. put his hand so he probably there. put his hand inside the but area. But we have override functionality, so that's okay. okay. If you see, we have restart turn, end, end turn, restart round. This was something that we realized was going to be a problem, not when we originally expected. But you have to clear the pucks off the table when you're playing shuffleboard for the next turn. So bounces off the wall and sits under the table like it would a hanger. Ah. Like, or like somewhere near the edge. Yeah, so these, really these cases, we cannot really di differentiate between this. Because so you either have to give up the fact that someone might have a puck like this. Depending on the lighting systems, I mean like, you might have, even if, even if you do have like a whole circle, it, it might not always pick up all of the blue, especially since these pucks are kind of glossy. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, that would be one of the flaws of buying the uh, cheapest pucks you can. <laughs> oh no, the score is wrong. What do we do? So we go to score override, and here we can change everything. So we can set the blue score, 
Back to zero. You have red one. Oh yeah. That Kid red one point. Then okay, we'll accept those changes. Cancel will obviously not apply. <clears throat> the first puck toss is always a little bit slower than the rest because it has to fill the camera buffer okay. with frames. <laughs> So, so that time it did score correctly. So it gave me three points because I'm leading and I'm in the three point zone. And uh, yeah. that's it. Yeah, and no, no, that's no it. other scores. So it's, it goes through, and as soon as it sees a puck a of a different color, color, it's like, it oh, stops scoring. Yeah. That's it. Okay. When um, you throw from this side, and this this the camera that you shoot, the camera from the side that you're shooting from detects it, motion. It'll start the timer, and if the other side doesn't see it in time. Then it will just detect a turn. But if the other side sees it at all, then we know that that camera has seen it and that you can basically pull for the steady state when puck stopped uh -huh. and then initiate a puck thrown that way. The camera, this side of the table waits for eight frames or around eight frames of non motion before it starts the timer because it means that that gives you time to like put your hand out and bring it back uh -huh. without um, you know starting the timer. Because it's like if you throw it out and it starts yeah. the timer right away, mm -hmm. yes. it might you know take a couple seconds to get to the other side and then you could have a chance of from the chance of scoring twice. The majority of the problems that we had starting out were uh, detecting the turns. That's probably like the single most time expensive thing to tweak to get correct. Because first it was like, um, it took too long to process them, so we had to implement the buffer. And then after the buffer was implemented, there would be false detections of turns. And it would be a lot easier, like if I turned on debugging, um, it keeps track of every frame that processes. So anytime something goes wrong or it detects a, a turn that it shouldn't have, or it detects a turn that it shouldn't have gone, or if it misses a turn, you can see what frames it was looking at. And actually, if you play them, if you press like, you know, the Windows view, picture viewer, if you hold down the next button, you can actually see like sort of like a slideshow mm -hmm. of like the pucks moving. And you can kind of see like, okay, it saw it here. Um, it started the timer, you know, and figured out if the other side saw it in time. So that, after I implemented that kind of, system it was a lot easier to figure out what was wrong mm -hmm. what was thing doing other things but since there's so many different menus and so many different subscreens it really got uh, extremely big so the way I would do it now would be to make each uh, screen a separate control and then have the main project just use all these controls instead of setting everything up in the main GUI so that would make it a lot slicker at least from the back end. Like, the user wouldn't see any difference, but it would make debugging a lot easier. Well, including the table, it cost about $542. And uh, the real main cost, other than like building the table, was definitely the cameras, because those were $64 each. Getting your thresholds, I guess, or color detection down is probably one of the biggest issues, because we thought that having stark contrast colors would help us out. And all of a sudden, black turns to blue and image processing worlds.